Yes, there is a case to be made for the theory that Sans and Ness are, in fact, the same person. And I'm going to break down that case for you today. This video has been one of my most in-depth outings yet, with several weeks spent researching, analyzing, and collaborating with others in order to support this argument to the very best of my ability. Godspeed. In February 2016, perhaps the most infamous video ever made on the Mother series was posted to YouTube. That's gone down in such infamy, its presence permeates the series' culture to this very day. It is not an overstatement to say that this video has contributed heavily to the Mother series' continued presence in popular culture since then, and is possibly the most well-known work online related to it. That is... MatPat of Game Theory's video, Sans's Secret Identity, in which MatPat proposes that the Undertale character Sans, not to be confused with Sans from Super Smash Bros., is the same person as Ness from Earthbound, not to be confused with Ness from Super Smash Bros. The video was torn to shreds across the internet and became a popular meme used to dunk on Patrick, even reaching the creator of Undertale himself, Toby Fox. Since then, the video has been a mainstay talking point when looking to discredit game theory, even being seemingly acknowledged by Super Smash Bros. series director Masahiro Sakurai, and was directly referenced in the film adaptation of Five Nights at Freddy's. My character's official name, right here, it's Ness. He told me it was a reference to Sans's Ness. He was very proud of himself. The video is nothing but a joke at this point, and rightly so, but man. I can't help but admire Matt Pat's courage, the absolute gall he had putting out a video like this. This video is a complete mess, a disgrace, and he took all the flag for it on the chin like a hero. So here we go. I'm, I'm gonna do it. I'm going to do my best to defend his argument and try to convince you that Sans is Ness. For real. But I want to lay a few things out first. First, this premise might be a non-starter for you, and that's fine. The proposition that these two characters from different franchises made by different companies with no canon connections may just be too far of a reach for you, and in that case you're not going to believe me no matter how strong an argument I make. Two, I want it to be perfectly clear that no matter how much I am defending this theory, I do not believe it. This is simply an exercise in how, if I did, I might have argued it. This is all for the fun of it. And three, please help me. With all that set up, let's look at the theory that started it all. It's time for a game theory. Before I propose how I'd fix this theory, I want to rip this thing apart. We need to start from ground zero here, so first I'm going to dissect and debunk all of what he theorized that I patently disagree with or see no value in before taking a look at where he's possibly onto something. This is going to be a long one. My first point of contention with my partner in crime is how he likens Sans to Ness in that they both teleport, citing Sans' knack for transporting all over the world of Undertale and walking through walls as being the same as Ness's PK teleport ability. No, this doesn't work. I can see where he's coming from, but there's some major flaws here. First, even if Sans is teleporting, Ness can't walk through walls. Two, and much more devastating, is that the worlds of Earthbound and Undertale are operating on very different sets of logic. Earthbound is much more grounded, with even its more fantastical elements only being exaggerated of which is already present in the physics and laws of our real world. Undertale functions on cartoon logic. Look at this, this game is working on Spongebob logic. Things pop in and out all the time, it's nothing like Earthbound. The only similarity in this respect is that the controls feel somewhat alike. He then claimed that despite Sans and Papyrus being brothers, they have different histories, but never comes back to this and supports why they might not be biological brothers. Shortly after is perhaps the most famous part of the video. When describing what's in Sans's workshop, in which he stakes the claim that the photo album that's found is the same one from the ending of Earthbound, the badge is the Franklin badge, the illegible handwriting on the blueprints is that of the Mr. Saturns, and the broken machine behind the curtain is the phase distorter. He then mentions the update that adds a photo album of three smiling faces with the words don't forget on it. Lots to take in here. So why is all of this ridiculous? Because it's all speculation and no evidence, which if there was, would make for a very compelling theory. You see, the problem isn't so much the outlandish claims he makes, it's that they're not propped up by any somewhat convincing pieces of evidence from any of the surrounding context of either game. The photo album isn't substantiated because the text verbatim says, There are photos of Sans with a lot of people you don't recognize. 
He focuses on those you don't recognize, suggesting they're the party and the other characters from Mother 2. But what kills this perspective isn't the people you don't recognize, it's the one you do. Sans. If this is that same photo album, how could Frisk know these two are the same person? As for the supposed Saturnian on the blueprints, that doesn't work at all. The symbols used by the Mr. Saturn to write are all still English, or some human language. This must be the case, as Lucas would have no reason to know this language, yet he can read it just fine. And if it is just a stylization of English, Frisk would be able to read it, as the monsters seem to speak English, as there's nothing to suggest that they have their own language, and is even demonstrated by Sans himself, with his use of puns, as they all correlate to English words and understandings, which with as many as there are in the game would not work this well if, say, some sort of monster language was being translated for the player. And him suggesting that Ness use the phase distorter and it fried his skin off… why? Why would he do that? He'd have no reason to use it again, right? And if it did indeed fry his skin due to it being organic matter, he'd just die. Yeah, he has magic powers, but he can still die, wouldn't he? And if he is, like Matt Pat says, from a long time ago, what would that have to do with anything? If he is from an alternate world and his skin was altered by the machine, the time that's passed is irrelevant, and also disproves his claim just after this that Undyne and Alfie's are at Summer's Beach, as that'd be… in another world. Similarly, this also debunks his own claim regarding the similarities in the worlds, of the games being similar, which they are not, really. Yeah, they both have a beach and a city laid out like this, but that's just a matter of the perspective. And yes, Onat has mountains, but not skyscraping peaks like Dalam. Also, are we even sure this is a sandy area like he claims? To me, it just looks like the light of the sun bouncing off the trees of the surrounding forest. But to be honest, it's not that relevant to the overall point. This is also further stretch, as he tries to lay claim it's also similar to the world of Mother 1, which, for all intents and purposes, is possibly an entirely alternate world, as that land's just called America, while in Earthbound, the country is called Eagle Land, which, although is meant to be a parody of the United States, ostensibly isn't actually the US. Also with the badge thing, patently unprovable or disprovable. Now, although this has already gotten quite out there, this is possibly the most ridiculous the video gets. Papyrus's curved arm and hand is a direct match to the curved arms of the Starmen in the Mother series. No, it's not. They're not standing anything alike. What are you talking about? As for the symbols on their breasts being similar, yeah, sure, but what is he implying here? That Papyrus is a Starman? Yes, yes he is. The Starmen are seemingly machines, not organic life forms. So, if Papyrus is a skeleton, you know, those things organic life forms have, doesn't that kill this point entirely? Yes, yes, it does. Even if you were to say Gygus for some reason gave them skeletons despite them being robots, these two don't match up at all. He even later says that he's straight up wearing Starman armor, which is flatly debunked by the fact Sans says it was made for a costume party, making this emblem more likely one trying to emulate military insignia, or, according to military slang, their fruit salad. After this, he basically says, they stand the same, he's literally him, which even though they do, makes for really weak evidence, if you can even call it that. In his final leap, he brings up Toby Fox's Earthbound Halloween hack, a, um, dated piece of work by the game director. I'm not going to go into all of what he says here for one simple reason. Toby's response. Fan theories are fun, but I feel embarrassed whenever someone calls attention to something I did when I was 16. I guess I should just accept bad rom hack with swears as part of my eternal legacy. Just because the two were both made by him does not mean they are connected and does not strengthen this theory, as this supposed evidence pulls from a tertiary source with no official link to either series. It exists in Limbo, and with the creator's disowning of it, confirms it's not canon to any of his work in any capacity. Also, he uses a picture of a Porky bot when referring to the actual Porky, poser. As you can see, I've got my work cut out for me with this one. So how on earth am I going to make you believe Matt Pat's premise that Sans and Ness are in fact the same person? Eh, I probably won't. But I'm going to try to at least repair the theory a bit and see if I can make it make a little bit more sense. 
I'm not trying to rebuild everything from scratch here. I'm just trying to add to the elements that are somewhat compelling and give them some better backing than he did. To demonstrate with better support, there is something here and maybe even get some of you to slightly reconsider. And I'd like to reiterate, I do not believe this theory myself. I just can't help playing contrarian sometimes though, teehee. One last thing to establish is that, straight out, this theory does not account for Deltarune. This theory, for the time being, assumes Deltarune is completely removed from Undertale's story and world in any form, and we didn't want to make any assumptions about it based on contemporary evidence that is subject to change. So, this theory is solely based on these two video games. And before anyone can be mean to me, I will also say that this is all satire and in Minecraft. So, without further ado, here's how I would remodel this theory. Let's start by getting rid of all of what's completely unusable and unfounded in the existing theory. We are completely discounting the Halloween hack, the photo album, Papyrus being a Starman, Sans's teleporting, the supposed Saturnian on the blueprints, and that they stand similarly. With that, let's pick up the scraps. To start, compared to all other monsters, Sans is a whole other beast, down to a biological level. When you're finally able to land a hit on Sans, he bleeds, but the other skeleton, Papyrus, doesn't, no matter how many times you hit him. This doesn't add up. Merely hitting Sans draws blood, but if one was to murder Papyrus, there's nothing. This could suggest that they're not even necessarily the same species, that Sans is different from all the other monsters in the underground. So, based on the game's suggestion that Sans is something different from the other monsters, is there any evidence for this outside what we just extrapolated? Yes. Sans has a keen awareness of alternate worlds and the land above ground, even referring to another place than the underground as his home, one he's given up on attempting to return to, and it doesn't seem like he's referring to the above ground world, at least not this one. He also has a clear understanding of things of the above world, like the sun, but there's also plenty of monsters who've made it clear that they've been around some time and did live above ground, like Asgore and Toriel. So what makes Sans different? For one, Sans and Papyrus supposedly just showed up in Snowden one day, more on that later. And two, Sans didn't know Toriel until they met through the door separating the ruins from the forest. If this is the case, how would Sans not know the queen of his kind if he too was exiled alongside the rest of the monsters? Surely he'd remember her. Sans also has properties that do transcend the game's world, commenting on how much the player has rematched him and changes in the space-time continuum. He even has far greater control over the mechanics of battle than other monsters do, even ones with similar battle-shifting traits. He also clearly has psychokinesis. This all does seem to suggest Sans is from another world, but one that shares qualities of this one. I want to revisit Toby's response for a second here. He made one response joking about the Sans and Ness spellings point MatPat brought up, but the primary ones are very focused on one specific point in it. The use of the Halloween hack as proof. Nowhere does he critique the theory's premise, it's that he's specifically bringing up the Halloween hack as the lackluster source of reasoning for it. I'm not trying to play, he didn't say it's not true so it is, I'm just trying to make a point that Toby is no stranger to intentionally making some things ambiguous in order to generate interest and fan theories. And I do think with some elements of Sans, he was trying to at least prod some players into thinking of Ness. That's not 100% fact that he is or isn't Ness, but just to make some think. One of the biggest problems with MadPat's initial video is its final reliance on the Halloween hack, which is entirely non-canon, which leaves a huge cavernous hole in the theory. That hole being, why and how would Ness end up here? In Undertale. Well, what if I told you there is a story reason from Earthbound itself that would give Ness motivation that land him there? Let's try and make the two series meet in the middle here. At the end of Earthbound, Porky leaves as he sees Gygus has been defeated, sneaking off to another world using the phase distorter he stole from Dr. Andonuts and his collaborators. After Ness returns and goes home, Porky's little brother, Picky, shows up at his doorstep that night. Picky tells Ness a letter was left by Porky, which reads, Come and get me, loser. Spankity, spankity, spankity. In the Magican sequence, the player is shown Ness's perception of Porky, where Ness sees Porky as someone who needs a friend and who's down on his luck. Throughout the whole game, Porky is up to no good, ruling cults, corrupting entire cities, even trying to bring on the destruction of the world with a cosmic demon, and pooping in the desert. Point being, Porky is a dangerous kid, capable of a lot of damage. 
This would all give Ness reason to actively pursue Porky, utilizing the phase distorter once again to stop Porky from doing further damage. A swing and a miss on that one. The phase distorter allows the user to transport to different places in space and time, and in his pursuit, maybe Ness got into some trouble on the way. I'm not sure if you've heard of time and space, but there's a lot of it, so tracking down one person and all of that can be a bit tricky, leading to a lot of searching. Something Dr. Andonuts gets wrong about the machine is that it can't transport organic matter. It can, it just seems to alter it. Porky appears blue in the distant past after having used it, but that might just be the lighting. But regardless, the effects of its use are clear when observing his appearance in Mother 3, in which it has distorted his appearance in both space and time, making him appear as a hyper-aged kid. These sorts of effects could very much have also happened in Ness, especially with all the searching he likely had to do in his pursuit of Porky. This could very much have caused hyper-aging effects similar to Porky's having taken to Ness hyper-aging him to the point he's a skeleton, a living skeleton with organs. Just a grave theory. In his expedition, maybe Ness ended up in a world similar to his own, an alternate reality, or sometime way far into the future. One so far removed from the present he lived in that the alternate reality version of him in this world has already died, or is yet to be born. It was in this world where the phase distorter broke down, and Ness was unable to fix it without the help of Dr. Andonuts. If this is some sort of alternate reality to the world Ness came from, this would explain why there are locations that greatly resemble ones from Earthbound, like Summer's Beach and other similar geography. But that doesn't explain him, Papyrus. How does he play into all of this? This one's a doozy, because if there's not even a single thread of possibility that they are not biological brothers, this theory's dead on arrival, more than the skeletons we're describing. So, is there any reason to doubt their brothers? Well, look at that, a single piece of string too thin to even use as fishing wire, a thread if you will. NPCs in Snowden claim the two just showed up and asserted themselves one day. So what does this mean? Despite their insistence that they are brothers, there is not a single person able to truly corroborate this. They call each other brother, but with the two of them being confirmed weirdos who just showed up one day and asserted themselves, there is at least some reason to say it's possible they're not biological brothers, but instead ones in a fellowship sense. They may be close, but not blood related, and they're seemingly the only living skeletons in the underground, and they're not inherently related just because they're both skeletons. Toriel and Asgore aren't biologically related after all. When they return to the surface, by the way, Sans refers to Papyrus as his friend. Not definitive, but I wanted to make note of it. I do not have some grand reveal of Papyrus' identity. He's just Papyrus. I theorize they met once Ness got stuck in this world. Papyrus, previously the only skeleton, meets Ness, who's stranded in this alternate reality. Papyrus, a person not highly regarded in this world, latches onto him, seeing as they seem to be destined to be companions, with, you know, another skeleton just falling out of the sky and all. This, in junction with No Way Home, forces Ness into hiding until he can, leading him to adopting a new name, Sans. The two grow close, eventually living in Snowden. Would this make the things in Sans's workshop the things Map had insisted were from Earthbound? Blueprints with unreadable handwriting, a broken machine, a badge, photos of people you don't know with Sans. That all seems to point to someone else, a W.D. Gaster, a character very much glossed over in the original video. The former royal scientist was working on a machine dealing with time and space manipulation, is someone you don't know, and would likely warrant special IDs to enter his lab, seeing how dangerous his studies were. There is no canon relationship between him and Sans, but nonetheless, it's strongly implied. Overall, very little is known about Gaster other than he fell into his creation, that dealt in manipulating space, time, and souls. Sands was also involved in these experiments somehow, and they come to a head as studies in determination. A trait Ness clearly demonstrated in his confrontation with Gygus, surviving the impossible odds and defying them by returning home after Gygus' defeat. If Ness was trapped in an alternate world, seeking the help of said world's most esteemed scientist would make sense for him to do, and together they'd study the effectiveness of time-space manipulation and the enduring and conquering nature of Ness's soul that allowed him to return home the first time. Along the way, these powerful and dangerous effects could have gotten to Gaster, driving him mad and the machine split his soul across time and space, a malfunction of how the effects initially transported Ness's soul from the robot back to his body. 
Additionally, when Sans dies, he dies like any other monster, albeit more dramatically. The sound that plays, however, is the same. This is important, because if Sans was seemingly so integral to the determination experiments, why would his soul be seemingly indistinguishable from all other monsters? Perhaps by spending years and years attempting to get back home and losing hope, he lost his courage, his drive, his determination, killing his possibility of getting home all the more, as it's what saved him before. His soul losing that spark, which makes human souls special, has faded, turning him too into a monster. The deterioration of a human soul in this way isn't directly backed by the game, but the opposite has been shown to have some gravitas. In the genocide route, Undyne is able to hold on after death despite being a monster by birth, but only through her determination is able to persist. If determination is what so strongly separates a human soul from a monster's, and a monster can find determination to briefly match a human's, then why couldn't this happen in the other direction? In order for Ness to integrate into this monster's society, he would need to be indistinguishable from other monsters, as dialogue in the genocide route shows monsters can sense other monsters on more than just a visual level. Sans himself even tells the protagonist that they're not human anymore after what they've done. But would Ness be the type to commit genocide? Well, that may be a bit more complicated than how the question sounds. Ness comes from a world that operates differently from the underground, one that functions, for the most part, in mainly blacks and whites in regards to how fighting is done. By mindlessly fighting, he could have degraded his soul into that of a monster's. But what about when these monsters beg for mercy? I think this would be a confusing thing to grasp for Ness. Much like the true form of Gygus, who also begged for Ness's help. In a reality where he's not sure of what anything is or who to trust, he might try resisting such pleas as to not be tricked by things that might not be what they seem. Sans is also notably the weakest of all the monsters, according to the game, so the amount of fighting required to bring him to this point is unclear. This would also be why he's so serious in regards to warning Frisk that their actions have consequences and will ultimately be judged and have to pay for them. It's why he takes such an interest in Frisk all around. As said before, a human soul is drastically more powerful than that of a monster's, so a young human roaming the underground poses both a great threat and great potential. Here we'll have to split things into the different alignment paths, so we'll take it one by one. Sans admits he would have killed Frisk if he wasn't told not to. So why would Sans want to kill Frisk? Pure bloodlust? No. What Sans, Ness, knows as a short chubby kid with a measurable power is in the underground and could turn it into their playground if they wanted to. Sound familiar? Yeah, we're going there. Partly. No, I'm not suggesting Frisk and Porky are the same person. But to Ness, who is now in a world that shares remarkable similarities to his own, could be led to believe Frisk is possibly this universe's Porky. Is Frisk Porky? No. Probably. But seeing this possibility, Ness would see a world he can save, even if he never catches up to the actual Porky, and in pursuing them, one of two things happens. One, the child shows despite their meddling, they want to save this world too. Or two, the child is a psychopathic murderer, in which case he takes matters truly into his own hands. It's also worth mentioning only one more human soul is needed for the monsters to return to the surface, an additional reason why he might want to kill them to get out of the underground to find someone else's help to help him fix the phase distorter to get home. So there you have it. If I did believe Sans and Ness were the same person, that would be how I would go about theorizing it. I'm in pain. Theorizing on fiction outwardly to the rest of a fandom can be rough, especially when taking bold, very bold strokes. Though I don't agree with this theory myself, I still admire MatPat's willingness to put himself in the hot seat and try to bring something new and daring to the discussion. 95% of the time, my theories are never meant to be taken seriously, to get you to think about your favorite games and movies critically, or through some different perspective. At the end of the day, does it really matter if Mario's a sociopath, or if Link is dead? That it's more about listening to the evidence and hearing a good story. He's not a dumb guy. In fact, he's very bright, even though he made some very apparent missteps along the way on this one. 
As fun as it has been to jab at him over the years, I wanted to try out this thought exercise and try to demonstrate the merits that do exist in what he had to say that everyone was so quick to dismiss based on the theory's weaker elements. God knows I've had my share of unpopular opinions. It's not bulletproof, but I think it at least makes it slightly more convincing than the initial theory did. But in reality, the truth is, Ness is all of us. He's Sans, he's me, yes, he's even you. There's a little bit of Ness in all of us. He's whoever you want him to be. Nah, just kidding, Ness is a waiter now. But if you're not in the least bit convinced, I hope this video was at least interesting and gave you what the original theory didn't. Cohesion and explanation. The theory will never be perfect, but it's at least fun to tinker with. That's why it's just a theory.